This is Southern Arch Heretic, Shifting the Burden, Pretrial Practice and Jury Selection. I'm Kit Rogers, and I have some questions. Welcome back to my Shifting the Burden series, where the proof for the existence of God is placed into a criminal trial setting, and the burden is on the believer to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. The non-believer is presumed correct in our exercise. How does the evidence hold up? Let's explore it. Pretrial practice. So there is no confusion in our system Before we get to the criminal trial court, the prosecutor must present their facts to a grand jury of citizens to determine whether or not probable cause exists to go forward with the prosecution. If the grand jury determines that the evidence of the truth submitted to them by the prosecutor tends to show that they should probably believe it, then they return with an indictment or presentment. This is the charging document. Probable cause is a much lower burden than proof beyond a reasonable doubt. For that reason, I'm jumping ahead to the trial court. Also, it's been said that the prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich, and as a former prosecutor who has presented serious cases to a grand jury, I can tell you that it, it's, it's not that hard to get an indictment. The grand jury procedure is a secret meeting, and what is presented to the grand jury is only the prosecution's point of view. And in some states, including my state, is also secret. Even though jurors are instructed to leave their presumptions at the door, I think that it's fair to presume, see what I did there, that the citizens that are members of the grand jury and or that will make up the jury for our trial most likely are believers. Welcome. Many of my friends and family are believers. I love them, and, you know, hopefully they'll continue to love me. A solid majority of Americans believe in God, and I can say with certainty that regarding the makeup of the population of the state in which I practice law, the believer majority is even greater than in the general population. This is important because, having been both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, I can tell you that jurors tend to think of prosecution as God's work or the more noble act and not the defense. I often tell my clients that when the jury pool walks into the courtroom and begins filling in the rows to start jury selection, as they pass, they're looking at him and they're wondering, I wonder what that son of a bitch did. When we get to picking our jury, I believe we're going to address some of these issues. But the point I'm trying to make is that even with the higher standard of proof being required of the prosecution, The cards are generally stacked against the defendant. Now, prior to the action of trial, picking a jury, and and moving forward, both sides must prepare, of course. For prosecutors, for our purposes, those that allege to know the truth, or believers, this means organizing the evidence that they intend to present. This evidence could be physical evidence, For instance, clothing, shell casings, bullet fragments, photographs, weapons, documents, any other items that tend more or less to prove a point that they're trying to make. Testimonial evidence, that's witnesses describing what they experienced, saw, heard, felt, etc. And scientific or specialized evidence, 
evidence usually requiring a qualified expert to introduce it. Prosecutors must decide which witnesses are necessary to introduce the evidence, including the physical evidence. Every piece of evidence must be introduced through a witness that's placed under oath unless otherwise agreed to by the parties. This means, for instance, the crime scene photographs are usually introduced through the crime scene technician that took the photographs so that the process can be explained and so that the evidence introduced can be authenticated and put into context for the jury. DNA evidence, or the autopsy report, for instance, must be introduced through the qualified expert that either created the report or can reliably testify about the information contained in the report in order to help the jury understand the alleged evidence. These rules are in place in order to try and ensure a fair trial for both the defendant and the prosecutor. We want reliable evidence. What constitutes reliable evidence and what that evidence means is why we have trials. We don't always agree. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Walt Whitman Jury Selection There are as many approaches to jury selection as there are trial attorneys. Books have been written, methods have been tested. I could write page after page concerning procedures, themes, questions, the method of questioning, and so many other aspects related to determining the proper juror. To tell the truth, even though I've picked more than my fair share of juries and have attempted to study and test as many approaches as I could in a natural effort to improve, I'm pretty sure my method at this point is just my personal preference. How do they respond to me? Certain specific questions asked to the jurors that are intended to elicit answers that indicate possible tendencies are useful. And what those questions are is arguable. I am perfectly comfortable stating that I'm no expert in jury selection. Most experts in that field are going to be psychologists or psychiatrists, possibly those that work in the social sciences. For my purposes, you are or the jury. I have no idea what life experiences or possible unrecognized prejudices you may bring. I have no way of asking you any questions to elicit those answers that indicate your possible tendencies. But it is important for you to understand that no matter what you believe or don't believe, the average juror, citizen, in America, according to the latest polls, is a believer. As I stated earlier, this fact may be more helpful in understanding the jury pool from the perspective of a defendant than it seems on the surface. In my experience, most people tend to believe that the police and prosecutors are keeping the community safe and prosecuting guilty people. And in most circumstances, but not all, I believe that to be true as well. When I speak to juries, I often say that we enter the courtroom with certain assumptions, presumptions, and prejudices that we may or may not even recognize. When I'm watching the evening news, not sure anybody actually does that anymore, or better yet, scrolling through a local news feed, and I see that a shop down the street from my house has been robbed, it gets my attention. Then when they report that the police have the suspects in custody, I feel better. 
The local news will display a mugshot photo of the individuals taken into custody, and my first thought is, oh good, they caught the assholes. Even though I know that the individuals are only charged, and it's only an allegation, I have assumed or presumed them guilty. That's my gut reaction. And I'm a fucking defense attorney. Luckily, in our secular legal system, a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury of citizens at trial. I feel that one of the most, if not the most important goals as a defense attorney at trial is to convince a naturally skeptical jury, usually skeptical of the defendant and defense attorney, that holding the prosecutors to that high burden is the only way to ensure that our system functions. We believe that it's the best and most ethical way to get it right, or more importantly, to make sure that we don't get it wrong. I want to emphasize that a trial in our system is intended to be an intellectual exercise, not an emotional one, and so jurors must try their best to be impartial judges of the actual evidence. Most jurors, in my experience, state in open court that they agree with the beyond a reasonable doubt standard and will hold the prosecution to its burden. The purpose of this anecdote is to about talking to juries is to illustrate that our system of proof requires us to leave those assumptions and prejudices at the door. The assumption or presumption can't be in favor of the prosecution. The presumption must be that the defendants are in the right unless and until the prosecutors prove to you that their truth is true and that they do so in such a way as to leave you with no reasonable doubt. That means that they will have reliably proven their God's existence and his active presence and participation in our world to a moral certainty. All I can do as defense counsel is ask that you the juror hold the prosecution, the believers, to their burden of proof. In this case, pursuant to the rules, the defendants, the non-believers, get the benefit of the doubt. Most of my life, I've kept the fact that I'm a non-believer either a secret or I've avoided the conversation. I felt that Somehow, I would offend friends and especially family by simply questioning and desiring proof of the propositions subtly, sometimes not so subtly, and continuously drilled into my head as a child and throughout my entire life. I was born, raised, educated, grew to adulthood, married my incredible wife, raised my two amazing boys in the southeastern United States what some refer to as the Bible Belt. I was steeped in religion and somehow still managed to question the veracity of its truthfulness. I hope that I can have some impact on the discussion going forward and that I can convince you, the juror, that those who claim to know the truth should be responsible for proving it beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty and that reliable evidence should be required to prove it. It's time to shift the burden of proof to the believer. Love ya. Mean it.